Welcome back to a little bit of philosophy. This is Philosophy 101, Unit 1, Lecture 4, The First Philosophers. In this short video, we'll look at a few of the first philosophers who characterized the early shift from the mythological to the rational worldview in the philosophical revolution of the 6th century BCE. In our previous videos, we looked at the historical and social context for the philosophical revolution, which began in the late 7th century BCE. We noted that this revolution in thought happened in ancient Hellas, or Greece, and discovered that it was part of a larger transformation of the Old World called the Axial Age. We also noted that the reason the philosophical revolution happened in ancient Greece was likely due to a unique set of geographical, economic, and political circumstances. What's sometimes difficult to fully comprehend is just how quickly this all happened. We sometimes think of the ancient Greeks as being an old civilization, and surely monuments like the Parthenon Athena on the Acropolis was as old as the Great Pyramids of Egypt. But in fact, we discovered that the Greeks are quite young by comparison. In fact, Socrates is historically closer to us than to Pharaoh Khufu. To better understand the time frame we're looking at, let's zoom in on our timeline of Western intellectual history and take a closer look at the period in which the philosophical revolution took place. We've noted that the ancient Greeks were an Iron Age civilization emerging out of the Dark Age following the Bronze Age collapse around 1200 BCE. Sometime between 800 and 750 BCE, the Greeks adopted the Phoenician alphabet and began recording their mythological narratives in the form of epic poetry, like Homer's Iliad. During the Archaic Age, small farming villages began to coalesce into the poloi, or city-states, as well as emigrating out of the Greek homeland to establish colonies around the Mediterranean and Black Sea Basin. The growing economic dependence on the export of wine, olive oil, cheese, wool, and fine pottery caused a trade surplus that would raise the overall standard of living for the Greeks, which was expressed in the development of public theater and sports, as well as the construction of monumental public buildings in the easily recognizable Doric style. The Archaic Age would finally come to an end with the clash of Greek and Persian civilization in the Persian Wars, with the triumphant Athenians at the Battle of Marathon and the allied Greek naval victory over Persia at the Battle of Salamis. What followed the Archaic Age was an explosion of Greek civilization that we know as the Classical Age, the flowering of that very creativity which grew out of the ashes of the Bronze Age collapse only 800 years earlier. This was the age of Pericles, Sophocles, Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. Compared to the civilizations that grew out of the agricultural revolution, which lasted for thousands of years, the Greek civilization was little more than a blip in the course of ancient human history. By the end of the 4th century BCE, Greek civilization would largely be absorbed into the growing Macedonian Empire to the north, who would themselves be overwhelmed by the expanding Roman Republic just 300 years later. So what we've called the Ancient Period, or Greek Period, can actually be divided into three distinct phases, the Dark Age, the Archaic Age, and the Classical Age. The period of the Philosophical Revolution, the period that we're interested in, is the Archaic Age. The thinkers we're going to identify as the first philosophers, or the pre-Socratic philosophers, are primarily from this Archaic Age. Now, in this video, we'll only touch on a few of those first philosophers in order to get a sense of what the early philosophical revolution looked like. To ask why, in response to events in the world around us, seems to be intrinsic to humans, but how we've answered that question has changed over time. For most of human existence, the answer was who, as in, these events are caused by some unseen person or persons. 
In some cultures, the who was defined as gods, in others, the ancestors or spirits, but the other that was considered responsible for causing the events in the natural world was inevitably personal in some fundamental sense. This is the heart of the mythological worldview, and as we've already seen, this answer dominated human consciousness until the first millennium BCE. The philosophical revolution would offer new answers to the age-old question, why? Instead of looking to the narrative mythology of their ancestors, the first philosophers offered an entirely new answer rooted in the natural world itself. Perhaps the answer to the question should be what instead of who. Perhaps understanding what the natural world was would provide greater insight into why the world is the way it is. This is why we properly label the philosophers before Socrates nature philosophers. They believed that understanding what the world was made of would answer why it is what it is, why it behaves the way it does. Now, when the first philosophers looked at the world, they saw order, regularity, predictability, which is precisely what the term cosmos in Greek means, the very word that would come to mean the universe. But this was strikingly at odds with the narrative mythological account of the world to be found in the commonly held view of things. If we were to take the mythological account of the world literally, the world should reflect the chaos of constantly battling deities, the embodiment of natural phenomena. Instead, we see that day always follows night, spring always follows winter, birds don't mate with horses, and cows don't give birth to fish. When we carefully look at the world around us, we don't see chaos, we see cosmos. So, if the mythological account of the world, steeped as it is in the personification of nature, doesn't match our observations, perhaps, just perhaps, it shouldn't be taken as an adequate answer to that fundamental human question. Why? This shift in human thought began in a small Greek city in the region known as Ionia, what we today call Turkey. Miletus was to become the center of the first halting steps toward the rational worldview. It was in Miletus that the first philosophers began to speculate that the reason the world was the way it was was inextricably tied to the most basic stuff of nature. Fortunately for those Greek thinkers, their periodic table is much simpler than ours. There were really only four elements that composed the world, but was one more elemental than the others? Was one of these elements responsible for the others, and how did their mixture cause the complex world that we see around us? Thales of Miletus was, as far as we can tell, the very first to head down this path, and in his mind, it was clear that water must be the prime element, responsible for everything we see and experience in the world. After all, water is everywhere. It falls from the sky, it comes from the earth, it's both in and necessary for sustaining all living things. Indeed, for the Greeks, it even appeared that the earth itself arose out of the water. Thus, he concluded that water must be the prime, or first, substance that causes everything else. Now, unfortunately, none of Thales' works survive to us today, so we can't examine the arguments, the logoi, that he gave to support his view. But his conclusions are recorded in the works of Aristotle, who points to Thales as the first nature philosopher. Whatever his arguments may have been, it is clear that others thought it flawed, as a later Milesian philosopher would propose an alternative element as the fundamental cause of the cosmos. Anaximenes, his much younger contemporary, proposed air as the fundamental element of the cosmos. Again, no original arguments survive, but Aristotle and other ancient sources tell us he was more profoundly concerned with how elements could function as causation. 
If Thales had been right, that water was the first element, then how did it transform into the other elements, and how do those elements interact? After all, if you put water in a jar and seal it, it doesn't do anything at all. Water must be acted upon. But air is always in motion. It has in itself the principle of change needed to explain how one element could be transformed into another, as well as how thought things might interact thereafter. Anaximenes identified a twofold principle of causation that could better explain the origin of change itself, as well as the continuing observable changes in the natural world. Condensation and rarefaction were the opposite forces contained in the motion innate to air itself. This twofold process also accounts for changes in temperature as motion causes heat and its lack causes cold. So, from Anaximenes point of view, in the beginning there was air, the immortal or prime element, and its motion causes condensation which produces water, which further condenses into Earth. When it reaches the point it can't be condensed any further, the process reverses in rarefaction, where Earth is transformed into fire, which through further rarefaction becomes air once more. This process of condensation and rarefaction among the elements not only causes them, but continually moves and mixes them together, ultimately forming the observable cosmos. Now, both Thales and Anaximenes were convinced that identifying the substance of a phenomenon would help explain that phenomenon. If there were four elemental substances, then either they were all equally primordial, or one of them must be the cause of the others, and they seemed to prefer the latter hypothesis. They were looking for the first element, the arche in Greek. After all, if everything in the universe is ultimately composed of one most basic substance, understanding it would lead to an understanding of everything else. But if there are four elements, why should one of them be more elemental than the others? This seemed to be the question that bothered Anaximenes' teacher, Anaximandros, or Anaximander as we usually call him. He agreed with his predecessor Thales that there must be one ultimate basic stuff, and like his student Anaximenes, he thought that it must be or contain the causal force that produces the observable cosmos. But why should it be one of the elements? Anaximander took a greater metaphysical leap and hypothesized the existence of another kind of substance, itself unobservable which is the RK from which the observable elements must be derived. And as there is no name for such a substance, he simply called it the infinite stuff, or the apiron. It was, he believed, this unobservable infinite substance that ultimately stood under all observable phenomena. Now, while these Milesian philosophers' initial hypotheses may seem naive to us, we have to keep in mind that this was only the beginning of what we would consider natural science, a rational explanation of the observable universe. But we had to start somewhere, no matter how simplistic it may seem from our perspective. But not all of the early philosophers thought the universe reducible to one single substance, the view known as metaphysical monism. After all, if we account for the stuff of the cosmos, there seems to be another fundamental kind of thing which we observe without actually observing it at all. Consider this bronze statue of a horse. Following the Milesian hypothesis, we understand the cause of the object to be the stuff it's made out of, bronze, which is just a form of earth. But can't the same stuff be used in the form of this dancing maiden? Simply considering the bronze fails to consider something else that seems to be another basic constituency of the observable phenomenon, just as basic as the bronze itself. That 
is the form of the bronze. If there were no form, there could be no distinction between the two things made from the bronze. The form is not the stuff, so it must be something distinct from the stuff. It was Pythagoras who introduced metaphysical dualism, the idea that there was more than one basic stuff in the universe. Matter and form are necessary for there to be cosmos, so both must exist in the cosmos. Now, everything we observe in the universe is a combination of both matter and form. Therefore, both must be existing things. But what kind of a thing is a form or pattern or number or ratio or harmony? We don't observe these patterns directly, and yet we see them in some sense. There's a part of us that grasps their existence through the material object we directly observe. And yet, unlike the objects, we can grasp these patterns even more clearly than the changing lumps of stuff that appear to our eyes. While a piece of bronze may be in the form of a triangle, I can even more clearly comprehend the idea of triangularity in that it doesn't come or go. It can't be created or changed into some other form. Triangle, for example, can never be square, and a circle is always and forever devoid of angles altogether. Unlike the material objects we see in the world, the number two will never be three, nor could two and three be mistaken for one another. And Pythagoras's dualism also applies to human beings, like everything else in the universe. We are a combination of both matter and form, our bodies being the material part, and the soul being the non-material part. But if the soul is like a number, it too will be able to exist independently of any particular material body. Hence, the soul is immortal and can, and indeed will, be attached to many individual bodies over the life of the universe. In other words, Pythagoras introduced the idea of reincarnation to the Western paradigm of thought. Another of the nature philosophers important for us to note falls closer to Socrates than some of these other archaic philosophers. In fact, he was a contemporary of Socrates, though they probably never met, as he was from Abdura in Thrace. As with most of the nature philosophers, none of his published works survive, and we're limited to quotes and fragments found in other ancient philosophers and historians. Keenly interested in mathematics, geometry, and aesthetics, Democritus is perhaps best noted for his insightful and revolutionary idea on the nature of the substance of the cosmos. Now, Democritus observed that everything around us can be broken or cut, meaning those things are divisible into parts. Now, if we take one of those parts, it too can be cut into other parts and so on. Applying reason to this observation, there's really only two logical possibilities regarding these parts. Either we can continue dividing things into smaller and smaller parts infinitely, or we can't. If the division is infinite, then there's no beginning point, and therefore no way to account for how or why the parts ever came together in the beginning. But if we take the alternative hypothesis that the process of division is finite, then we must ultimately arrive at some smallest thing, which is not composed of parts, and will therefore be uncuttable. The Greek term for an uncuttable thing is atomos, an atom. The atomic hypothesis opens the door for an explanation of the world of observation in a way that its alternative hypothesis does not. If the unobserved atoms come together to the form the things that we see, then they must be in motion. And if they are moving, there must be something for them to move in. A void. As the atoms move through the void, they will inevitably come in contact with other atoms 
in order to form larger things. But how would they join together? It must be because they have slightly different sizes and shapes. When two atoms of different shapes collide, they sometimes become entangled, forming a larger compound thing. This process continues until larger and larger things are formed, and this is what we ultimately observe in the world around us. Complex combinations of ever-moving atoms coming together and breaking apart. It's truly remarkable that Democritus arrived at the atomic theory using nothing more than observation and reason. He didn't even have a magnifying glass, let alone an electron microscope. Of course, his atomic theory would not be fully embraced as an explanatory hypothesis of the natural world for another 2,000 years, but it demonstrates the power of the philosophical revolution. The shift from mythos to logos meant that the cosmos was knowable. The answer to why the universe is the way it is awaits human investigation through observation and reason. Despite the differences in their views, all these early nature philosophers share a common assumption about the process of explaining the phenomenon in the world around us. If we want to understand the things we observe, we must understand they are complex, and that means we must first understand the nature of the parts. This is what we call redu the reductivist hypothesis. Whether things are made of water or air or atoms, understanding the nature of the parts will lead to an understanding of the whole. And no matter how naive the theories of these first philosophers may seem to us, it's important to remember that our entire approach to understanding the natural world today is based on these first steps toward a logical explanation of the world. What we call science is really just a continuation of the application of reason and observation, unrestricted by religious or political orthodoxy, which began with these first nature philosophers. But not all the early philosophers adopted the reductivist hypothesis. Some contemplated the universe as a whole. This brings us to the last two nature philosophers we'll examine in this all-too-brief overview of the pre-Socratics. When Heraclitus of Ephesus looked at the world around him, he noted one ever-present reality that is easily overlooked. All things change. It's easy to think of the universe as a kind of place full of things. Indeed, ever since the agricultural revolution, humans seem to have been overwhelmingly preoccupied with accumulating things, and the more things the better. The whole history of human civilization is, to a large degree, characterized by the acquisition of things we value. But what if the value we place on the objects we accumulate is misplaced? What if the things we seek to acquire are not things at all? Heraclitus was deliberate in making his ideas difficult to grasp, but one of the metaphors he used can help us begin to understand his radical approach to metaphysics. Imagine standing on the banks of a river and watching the water flow past. Light shimmers off the surface, and currents and eddies constantly appear and then disappear on the surface of the water as it flows by. Now imagine that you take such delight in one of these swirling eddies that you decide to catch it, to keep it. This thing, which is such a delight to your senses, after all, is a thing, isn't it? Why shouldn't you have it? But as you thrust your hands into the water to capture this thing, you discover that it disappears from existence. Now, what if the universe is actually like a river? Not a room full of things to possess, but rather a continual flow, continuously changing set of appearances which have no permanence in themselves whatsoever. What if you and all of the things around you are nothing more than eddies swirling into and out of existence as part 
of an ever-flowing cosmic river. From this perspective, you see that the idea of permanence is little more than an illusion of time. For Heraclitus, change is what characterizes the cosmos, not permanence. All the things we observe and hold dear, even ourselves, are nothing more than a continually changing set of states, none of them real in themselves, none permanent, but merely momentary states in an eternally changing process. Now, if that makes your head swim, if you'll pardon the pun, strap yourself in for the opposite point of view. Parmenides of Elea, a Greek colony on the southern Italian peninsula, held that change, whether motion, time, or form, is an illusion that keeps us from understanding the universe as it truly is. Basically, Parmenides is giving us exactly the opposite view from Heraclitus. In short, Parmenides held that any form of change requires the existence of something that doesn't exist. Since what is, is, it can't come into be, nor can it cease to be. Nor can that which is not, because it doesn't exist, begin to exist. There are many thought experiments to illustrate his point, but I've created what I think is a fairly simple one that illustrates the problem regarding change in place, or what we call motion. Consider these two objects. Are they the same, or are they different? Obviously, they're different. Not that one is a bowl and the other is a rubber ducky. Those are just labels. They are different in their color, their shape, their place, and their function. We call these things properties of an object. More abstractly, we could call them the whereness, the howness, the whatness, and the whyness of these things. If there were no differences between them, then there would be no reason to say that they are different. So let's see what happens if we eliminate some of these differences. By eliminating the difference of function, we still have a difference in color, place, and orientation. One is facing to the right, and the other is facing to the left. In this example, we've eliminated the difference of color. After all, color could be an artifact of our eyes, part of our visual apparatus, but we still have a difference that leads us to claim that they are two different things, place and orientation. In this final example, we're left with only one real difference, the whereness of the objects. Even if they are the same material, the same size, have the same function, and are both oriented in the same way, they're still different because of their whereness, their place. But what if we tried to eliminate this last distinction? If we try to put them together in the same place, we can't. They just won't go into the same space. But why? When we consider the rubber ducky's distinction in awareness, we see that one is occupying one place and the second another. We can call these place A and place B for reference. We can't put both duckies in the same place if that place is already occupied. Place A is occupied by ducky one, and place B is occupied by ducky two. Those places are full and do not allow for something else to be in the same place. But what about the place or places between A and B? It is precisely because there is nothing that lies between them that allows Ducky 1 to move through those places. Motion, in other words, is only possible if there is nothing occupying the places the object is moving through. Motion is a change in location, the place where the thing was versus where it is now. So, for motion to occur, there must be something that is, which is moving through what is not. But this requires us 
to assert that nothing is something. And this is Parmenides' concern. How can nothing be something? His answer is that it's utterly meaningless to assert that nothing is a kind of something. We're just making noise with our mouth, since there's no thing to be referred to by the word nothing. It's, it's just gibberish. So if nothing is no thing at all, we realize that it cannot exist, and we are left with only that which does exist. Hence, motion is an illusion, since it requires us to posit the existence of that which doesn't exist, and cannot exist. There is only that which is. There is only being. One bit can't be distinguished from another bit without positing a nothing between the bits. The same is going to hold true for all kinds of change. Temporal, spatial, formal, substantial. Change is impossible because it requires what cannot be. It requires the existence of that which does not exist. Now, regardless of whether Heraclitus or Parmenides is ultimately correct, or for that matter, whether they're both wrong, what we see in them is a different approach in metaphysics to the reductivists of the Milesians, Pythagoras, and Democritus. And all of these natural philosophers represent the first halting steps toward a logical or rational worldview based in human observation and reason. These first steps would shape the classical philosophers to come, most notably Plato and Aristotle, and they in turn would shape the development of the emerging Western intellectual tradition which continues right down to the present moment in human history. It's important to remind ourselves in closing that we've only given the barest outline of only some of the first philosophers. Our purpose here was simply to give a basic outline of some of the ideas that began to emerge out of the philosophical revolution. There is so much more that could be said about these pioneers in thought. And one could spend their entire life exploring these nature philosophers. But I hope this short video has provided you with at least a basic introduction to the way philosophy began to change our understanding of the world and our place in it. I hope you'll come back again as we continue to explore a little bit of philosophy.